Hey guys, how are we doing? So we're back on another uh, video from Annie News. I say video, we're doing videos. Um, we're on Karna, Lancer of Red, explained. But there's two parts. I'm just going to do them both in the uh, in the same video. Uh, saves spreading these out for longer than needed, and I think you guys appreciate when I do these, so that's cool. So um, let's do this. Karna, Lancer of Red, explained. I love these fate apocryphal like. Um, Backstories, so interesting, and it makes sense for the phantasms and why they do things. The Shakespeare one was so interesting. I didn't think it would be that interesting, but the Shakespeare one was like, that makes so much sense. So this, let's get into this. Karna, Lancer of Red explained. This two part rulers, one. two assassins, one berserker, one caster, a trap, and yep. finally we get to one of the lancers. All right. I'm surprised it took this long. Actually. Hey, Vlad was pretty cool. Both are pretty badass characters with some rather OP abilities that made yeah. some seriously gorgeous looking fights. But since they weren't waifu material, no. or a guy dressed up as waifu material, mm. then I guess they didn't quite ping on your weebu radars. But after Karna's amazing fight from episode 22, he reached the level so of badassery that was enough to beat out Atalanta's beast mode noble phantasm. Boom. So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a closer look at the Lancer of Red, aka Karna, the son of the sun god. Sweet. As always, let's begin by talking about the Lancer class in general. Yeah, Another one of talk the about the class, and then get into the backstory. Alright. They're basically the discount versions of the Saber class, boasting high proficiency in pretty much every area, especially agility, and a significant amount of magic resistance. As you'd expect, their weapon of choice is a spear, lance, mm -hmm. or pretty much any long-range melee weapon. They pretty put their extreme point. agility to use by implementing hit-and-run tactics to get in quick strikes from range, then quickly switching back to the defensive. Other than that, lancers don't really stand out as being the best or the worst at anything. They're like just there to be a formidable tier? opponent. Yeah. Which might be why both Vlad and Karna managed to stay under the radar for so long in the polls. So let's take the time to put the spotlight on Fate Apocrypha's Lancer of Red right now. Mm -hmm. The god who has the literal ability to spawn a sun, yet still manages <laughs> to somehow lose to this. Eh. Well, I'm over it. Eh. <laughs> let's just talk about who he was back when he was alive. Cool. I'd recommend hunkering down for this one because this might be a long story. As with any person, Karna was brought into this world by his mother. Cool. But his mother was married to a king that was cursed to never be able to bear a child. Oh. Being a queen, it was her duty to give birth to an heir, so other ways of birthing children were researched. After a bit of time, a sage had given her the ability to have a child gifted to her if she asked. All she oh. had to do was just ask any of the 303 million gods to give her one. Curious as to how her newfound powers worked, she asked the sun god Surya to give her a child. Oh. And so he did presented to her a baby named Karna, who was clothed with golden armor and earrings as proof he was the son of a god. Cool. Oh, and this armor happened to make him invulnerable, but that's not really important right now. That's kind the of important. The king didn't know of this ability yet, so her having this baby without his knowledge may not have been received very well. So what does any good mother in a legend do to a child when they don't want them? They leave them in a basket by the river. No. I don't know what it is, but there's something about rivers and babies that seems to be quite a reoccurring yeah, theme in Yeah, it does seem stories. to be, doesn't it? Oh. But anyway, it was because of this that Karna was raised by a different family of a much lower class. Right. He still knew that he was the son of a god and that his mother had abandoned him, but he didn't resent her for it. It was more of a feeling of disappointment that things had to turn out this way. Oh. It was also because he wasn't raised by his mother that he wasn't able to learn proper human emotion. He just lived his days observing the motions of the lower class, all while and then learning by it. watching. It was through this that he decided to live in a way that honored the people who brought him up and the god that created him. So now we get to a teenage version of Karna, who had been training in martial arts for some time now. Cool. During this time, a tournament was being held to display the power of the Pandava brothers, five princes born from Karna's same mother, each from a different god. Oh. There was a moment during this tournament that an opportunity arose for someone from the crowd to present their skills. Cool. Karna, of course, rose to this challenge awesome. and was able to perform some of the feats better than any of the princes, including the third prince named Arjuna. I'm pretty sure I said that wrong, but just bear with me. Ah, I do all the time. <sighs> but anyways, he was the son of the thunder god Indra. Right. And at the time, <laughs> he was considered to be the most skilled archer. Karna proceeded to challenge this prince to a duel. Nice. But since they were not of equal status, he was denied and made a fool of for even attempting. Oh. Through all this mockery, a prince from a different family saw retribution in Karna and took him in and made him a king at his palace. Oh. He saved Karna from the disgrace of being known as someone who doesn't know their place in the That's world. That's cool. But being named a king didn't save him from the ridicule because it was later found out that he was raised by a lowly charioteer. The Pandava brothers would not leave that fact alone and would constantly ridicule him and his father for being born of such low status. 
A rivalry began between the six of them, but more importantly, between Karna and Arjuna. Karna belonged to the Kauravas family, a royal family whose influence rivaled that of the currently leading power of the Pandavas. And as the relationships between the Kauravas and the Pandavas grew worse, mm -hmm. so did the rivalry between Karna and the brothers. Eventually, a war called the Mahabharata War broke out in the, the battle to control the other's war. territory. Now, with Karna leading the army, there was no one other than Arjuna who could possibly stand against him on the battlefield, especially with that armor that made him invincible. But even Arjuna knew that trying to fight Karna would lead to certain death. Mm. Now, Karna's mother, who was always on the side of the Pandavas, witnessed many of the battles between the two armies. But she knew that no one would be able to stop Karna, so she came up with a plan to reveal Karna's royal lineage to him and hoped that he would switch sides. Oh, right, so if he knew his route. Karna did not right. decline the offer, but instead posed a question to his mother that questioned the timing of her revelation. Oh. He pretty much said that if she could accept the past without feeling any shame, then he would oblige. But his mother knew she acted for her own sake. Yeah. And as such, she couldn't accept Could not her do actions that. as reasonable, yeah. so left the negotiations without another word. Before she could leave, out of respect for his mother and her actions, Karna mentioned that he would not fight any of his half-brothers on the battlefield other than Arjuna. The many ensuing battles right. were won by Karna and his armies, and he had plenty of times to kill the Pandavas brothers, but he remained Just true didn't... to his words. Cool. Allowing wow, them to flee what a each dude. Time and fight another day. As the final battle drew near, the God of Thunder took the form of a Hindu priest in order to get close enough to Karna to steal his golden armor. No! Now remember, what a this prick. armor made him invincible. Yeah. So losing the ability to not die is kind of shitty that's when you have to go fight a war the next day. Big deal. Karna, being the badass he is, didn't even care and still set foot in that battlefield, so not to bring shame to his own father. That's he class. Even went as far as to approach Indra and praise him for being a step it's ahead. It's like, screw it. So what if I'm not invincible anymore? I'm still going to beat Indra, him. out of admiration and respect for Karna, presented Karna with his spear, a gift that Arjuna wasn't even worthy of. Oh. And with that, he proceeded to his final battle with Arjuna. It was a grand battle fought with two chariots that was so intense that even the heavens opened up so that all the gods and deities could witness two could of the watch greatest it. warriors fight. Yeah, cool. But during this, Karna's chariot wheel became stuck in the mud due to a curse that he received as a child. Karna requested a pause of the fight since it was proper war etiquette to fight fairly and on even terms. Oh, man. Arjuna was persuaded by Krishna, one of the supreme Hindu gods, to attack Karna while he was defenseless. Mm. Karna saw this coming and defended himself and retaliated with an attack of his own that left his opponent unconscious. But instead of killing Arjuna, which he was waited. against proper etiquette, he used that time to get his chariot wheel unstuck. As Arjuna recovered from his wounds, he drew his bow once more and decapitated the defenseless Karna. Karna didn't hate his half-brother for this, but instead accepted his death and moved on into the afterlife. What? It was after this that he became known as the hero of generosity. Damn! Never bearing resentment to anyone, and always helping those who relied on him for it. Which is a good explanation for Karna's compassion in the letter of- Yeah, the cool! It sure as hell shocked me when I heard Karna mention that he wanted to save his master. Mm. Definitely not something that you'd expect out of someone that's constantly being compared to Gilgamesh. Mm. But yeah, that's pretty much Karna's story. Like, the very summarized version of it. I had to leave out the parts where he got trained and cursed, and even the parts where he took on a worldwide military campaign and succeeded with conquering the world. But if I did, then I'd have to talk about a whole lot more than just Karna's main story. Yeah, like, I'd have to you want to make it just fit with people, the fate stuff the as well. Culture, and then that would just be straying away from the purpose of the video. Yeah. Now, I was going to cover his abilities and noble phantasms too. We did that part two. But I think I'll do that in the next one, which should be out really soon. I promise it won't be a week later like last time. I'm on break, and I plan on releasing a lot of content before I have to go back to work. So yeah, I'll be seeing you guys again really soon. So until next time, ciao. Ciao. Awesome, right? What a freaking cool backstory. What a guy. What a genuine dude. <laughs> wow. Right, let's get into part two. And I'm back. All right. Bet you didn't think this video would be out this soon, did you? Well... But as I Sorry said, for me. <laughs> I'm on break and plan on releasing a whole lot of content. So let's jump right into this video on oh abilities and noble phantasms. Cool. But first, quick, I forgot to let you guys know last episode that this does cover up to episode 22 in the anime. The so if you Beverly Van, I've seen the, the whole thing. Just click off the video. So unlike okay, Shakespeare, who had only one noble phantasm mm -hmm. and a few skills, Karna is stacked with four noble phantasms four. and more skills than I honestly feel like counting. Jesus. So let's start with the big guns. His noble phantasms. Mm -hmm. Starting with the most obvious one. His golden armor and golden earrings. Immortality. This is called Kabaka <laughs> Kundala. O sun become armor. 
you already know that this armor was meant to signify his godlike lineage. Yeah. But it was meant to make him invincible. It into existence because she had prayed for his son to be born with something that could confirm his heritage. And as such, Karna was born with the armor as part of his body, which you already knew made him invulnerable. Yep. Now, if you watched part one, you know that the god of thunder, Indra, was able to steal this armor from Karna. Yep. But you're probably wondering that if it was part of his body, how did he, steal how did he it? even yeah. manage to rip it from his skin? Well, for personal circumstances, while Karna was a child and training with the Hindu priests known as Brahmin, he made a promise to himself that he would never deny a Brahmin's request. So when Indra had disguised himself as one, Karna knew that he wasn't actually a Brahmin. But just the fact that he had the appearance of one meant that he had to oblige. Oh. You know how these heroic spirits are. Once they make a contract, they'll they fulfill it to the best of their abilities. Yep. But yeah, even though Karna knew that it was a trap, he still released he still did it anyway. Jeez. And it over. Although the armor was lost during his life, he still carries it with him in the Holy Grail War. And it essentially has the same effects as when he was alive, making him damn near invulnerable. That's pretty it's a defensive damn type of powerful. That protects him from pretty much all damage, whether it be physical or conceptual, by reducing the actual damage to around 10% of what it should be. If it was to have a weakness, it would be that it doesn't protect the inside of his body. So when Vlad had fought Karna and spawned the spears inside of him, oh. it actually did a fair amount of damage to him. Yeah. His next noble phantasm that goes makes hand sense. in hand with the armor. It plays off of the part of Karna's story in which he receives Indra's spear. The amount of nobility that Karna demonstrated as he handed over his armor knowing that it was a trap led to Indra feeling that the only right thing to do was to give Karna his spear as compensation. Hmm. It's known as Vasavi Shakti, Vasavi Shakti. Son to death. A spear that was so powerful that it was said to have never been handled properly, not even oh. by the Thunder God himself. Wow, it's so OP, no one can use it. <laughs> because the spear can only be properly. summoned once Karna permanently strips himself of his armor. So it's got to be pretty worth it if he's planning on giving up invulnerability to fight with this spear. The power that is normally used in Karna's armor is transferred over to the spear and channeled into one attack only. But my god, is it a powerful attack. Mm. It's said to have the ability to kill the gods themselves, granting it the title of not only an anti-army, but also an anti-divinity noble phantasm. Jesus, anti-divinity. considering it was a weapon created and used by a god. God. I had also mentioned in part one that this man can literally spawn a son, and this is exactly what happened That's when he enlisted this attack. That's pretty damn brutal. <laughs> it's almost as if the only way to survive it is to have a lot of plot armor, a convenient noble phantasm handed over that negates almost every attack. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, that's just me being a little bit salty. <laughs> this attack is supposed to obliterate beasts, wrong, shields, fortresses, and bounded fields alike. But if it wasn't for Achilles' noble phantasm that had unique properties, uh -huh. then that fight would have been over right then and there. I'm pretty sure that the only thing that counters Karna's noble phantasm is Achilles' noble phantasm. Yeah. So, in so a he way, gives it to someone else. That Karna is even more OP than Gilgamesh. And it's not like Gilgamesh could even pull out this weapon from his gate of Babylon, since it technically never existed in the real world. Ooh. Karna died before he could ever get to use the spear in battle, so any mention of it is just myth. His third is called Brahmastra Kundala. Cool. Oh Brahma, curse me. Oh Brahma. And it goes hand in hand with his Not mana burst skill that puts magical energy Not into a the burst. Body. This magical energy usually takes the form of flames that can spawn inside his body and emit outward and transfer to any weapon that he holds. Looks so cool. This noble phantasm increases the range and area that his mana burst skill can affect, as well as provides for a projectile type explosion that is on the same scale as a nuclear bomb. <sighs> In order to use it though, Karna would have had to drop his armor and deploy the Vasavi Shakti. So you won't typically see this unless it's in a final fight type situation. Then there's his fourth, called Brahmastra, O Brahma, cover the earth. Karna opens his right eye, calls upon the god Brahma, and emits what's Looks so a freaking cool. It's it. so cool. Look it's at that. That's amazing. Mana burst skill where instead of emitting flames from everywhere, it's channeled and projected in a small powerful burst. This attack doesn't work when fighting someone who's stronger than him because as he was cursed in his legend to die helplessly against an equal opponent, oh. the same curse limits this attack. But considering that there are a few servants that are actually stronger than him, I didn't mention the curse in the past one. He mentioned it, but that's what it was about. Now, what about his other abilities? He has a skill that is directly related to being known as the Hero of Charity. Uh -huh. It's called the Discernment of the Poor, and it lets him determine the true character and motives of other people. So that's an interesting fact to know, considering that this lets him see right through Shiro's lies and deception, and determine what his true plans are. 
meaning that if Shiro truly had sinister intentions, then Karna most likely would have done something about it. Mm. Simply put though, it's a built-in lie detector, and it comes from his years of observing the people of the lower class that he was brought up with. Get another example of how the legends mold the servant. Then, it's not like Karna needs it, but he also has magic resistance as a standard for any Lancer class. Damn. He also has the riding skill, much like many of the other knight class servants. Then he has what's called uncrowned martial arts, which uncrowned makes his skill arts. and ability seem weaker than it actually is, unless his true name is... Oh, determined. that's pretty damn cool. I think that's more of a skill for the game, so not really relevant in the anime, right. considering that he just freely introduces himself as if he cares whether or not people know his true name. Mm, the man just, just wants to throw out. hands in a fair fight for the ages. Now, all these the skills and abilities are nice, throw hands. but if his master wasn't Shiro, the amount of magic that would be needed to sustain any type of fight would be monumental. It's mentioned that a top-rate mage wouldn't even be able to keep Karna's basic mana burst skill activated for more than 10 seconds. I'm Whoa. not entirely sure how viable Karna would be in a normal Holy Grail war, but it's still interesting to consider how each of these servants fit into their role in the show so conveniently. It's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle, because if you bring in someone as OP as Karna, you've got you gotta to have bring someone in someone else. who can support his existence. Yeah. And if you don't plan on having him win the war, then you have to bring in someone who can counter him. Mm. Anyway, that's Karna's capabilities in a nutshell. We pretty much got to see it all in action in episode 22, so I think if you were to watch that fight over again, things would make a bit more sense, since we never really got anything explained to us in terms of Karna's story or strength. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you want to help decide who I cover in the next episode, then go vote in the poll under the community section. So until next time, ciao. Ciao. Class. So there we are. Karna, Lancer of Red, explained. Both parts 1 and 2. Very interesting. I love seeing the backstory and then seeing how everything's like, boo, it's so cool. I love these videos. I absolutely love it. And I love that you guys, like, enjoy them as well. Cause, God, the Fate series is so good. <laughs> the Fate series is so good. I think when I finish JoJo's Bizarre Adventure with my girlfriend, I'm going to show her um, Unlimited Blade Works and then Zero and then go from there. Because, my God, what a journey that was for me. I was like, oh, and then we'll go through Apocrypha, and then I'm not really enjoying Last Encore. I'm still putting off the last, like, few episodes, but it was all right. You know, when one thing's amazing, and then you watch something else, and it's not as good, but it's, like, ah, it's, you think, ah, it, it winds me up. But anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this? Click a like, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave comments down below. Let me know what you want to discuss in future videos, and I'll see you guys. Yes, all you guys, next time.